Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Welcome to We Have Ways to Make You Talk with me, Al Murray, James Holland, uh, your second World War podcast. Do you know Jean? Um, how are you, Jim? Yeah, I'm not too bad, actually. And and could that that opening two words be more appropriate oh, well, to the one we talk about been, today? But we'll, we, I don't want to reveal yeah. what we're going to talk about yet, just yet, because nah, you know, well, build the anticipation. Been, yeah, 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 um, yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I was careering around the country last week, so I was in Cambridge on Thursday and I was at Hay on Y on on Friday, it was all good fun. So yes, I'm, well, I mustn't forget. I just mustn't forget to mention is that I am finally doing a kind of sort of Sherwood yeah. Rangers Brothers in Arms tour of Normandy. Yes, you are, at the, aren't you? The very end of April, beginning of May next year. Yeah. So before all the hordes yeah. descend for Normandy 80th. So we're going to yeah. go and follow all Brilliant. the all the places for for five days or whatever it is um, that the Sherwood Rangers were in Normandy from from their landing on on Gold Beach all the way down to crossing yeah. of the Noiro and all that. Um, so Fabulous. it's going to be great fun. And uh, doing this for Trip Smiths. So if you Google Trip Smiths Brothers in Arms or Trip Smiths James Holland, um, yep. up it will come. Uh, it'd be very nice to see anyone who fancies joining me on that. I don't think I'll be Fabuloso. doing it again, to be honest. Excellent. Unique once Excellent. once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> yes. Etc. Oh, how are you? Time. How are you getting um, on? Yeah. I'm very well. Yeah. Um, uh, progress I'm being of, made um, on Arnhem. Progress being made, and I had a very nice meeting with um, well, with basically your designer, who I, oh, I yeah. inherited your designer. Yeah, um, the lovely Phil. Uh, um, that Phil, who's who's a listener. So hello, Phil. Yeah, he's Phil's absolutely amazing. A nice independent company member. Hello, Phil. How are you? Thanks for thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we were talking about stuff, and he went, "Yeah, yeah." You talked about that on the podcast the other day. I thought, God, he he really he really does listen to it. So you know, discussions about Google Earth and stuff, or how to do sort of do a 1940s Google Earth is the sort of um, the, the thing to try and do. Anyway, uh, we have Waste Fest, by the way. Um, Jim and I, um, uh, last at the end of last week, were wrestling with what the program is going to be. We're, we're um, pretty much done now. Almost done for now. I mean, obviously, a few tweaks and changes. Um, I'm still, I, to be honest, I'm still um, sort of mentally sifting, having read the Dudley Qua- Clark memoir, Rob Hutton's book, The Illusionist. I think. The more I think about it, and the more I think about Cascade, which is the thing he did in where yeah. he faked salt troop numbers and, and basically trickled this idea, this picture out to the Germans. The more I think about that. And then, of course, Bodyguard is the sort of inheritor of that. The more I think about that, the more amazing it is that it actually ends up with Churchill going, why can't we do this? We've got 40,000 men in Crete. <laughs> and, and it's, or Cyprus or wherever it is We've got 40,000 men in Cyprus why can't we do this and basically and Clark files it under you know hostile elements fooled or whatever <laughs> or, you know because Churchill's been skim reading the intelligence briefs and has misunderstood Very funny. Well, I mean to be fair he does have a lot of reading matter every day well he has a lot he's got a lot on his plate but, the, yeah, but, the, but it's just, there's something really funny about him for him fooling it that it that, that it worked it, it's that convincingly painted a picture it's such an interesting and it's such an interesting idea because um why why is it first airborne and sixth airborne division well because the idea is the british are going to form seven and so you've <laughs> is that really so yeah except they don't they can't they haven't got the people so you that end up bonkers with one anyway and six, they haven't got so... the means of delivering them etc etc exactly yeah but you, you you it's one and six so you assume there's two three four five and then yeah and then uh, you you name you name a battalion seventh airborne division for a bit, create the impression that there are seven. I mean, it's 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 simple, but if you're you know accepting that there's a fog of war, yeah, you sort of put these lur- the, the idea that these sort of lurking shadows that you Clark's method is to make sure that all the intelligence and all the stories he offers the Germans there's an out. So when it turns out to be wrong, they can go, oh, it was wrong all along, and you, you know that there's enough there's enough in what he offers them to for them to go. Of course, it's uh, uh, there was right. something that contradicted that, um, which is, I think, the, the subtlety and the ingenuity yeah. of that, because because it, it sat with min- mince meat alongside it, which which um, Rob sort of thinks the problem with mince meat is all terribly obvious, and the fact that mince meat. Boy, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? I mean, it's hard. Well, to, yeah, it's hard and to the, disagree. But, but, also the fa- but, but but you know, he also, and of course, it's after the event. But the fact that mince meat rumours get out Changed about mince the course really of quite- World War Two. 
Well, exactly. But rumours get out about it quite quickly. Montague tries to write a book about it quite quickly yeah. and succeeds and then writes the movie, you know, is involved in the movie and everything. Yeah, the fact yeah. that, you know, there's a film about it, you know, only a decade later, so it suggests that really it's not that important, is it? Because it's because you've blown it. It's blown as an idea straight away. And I think that that's really interesting. That's, you know, and it, obviously it's a, gri- it's a good story because it's sort of grisly and it shows allied ruthlessness and all this sort of thing. Whereas... What Clark's doing, this is a very subtle thing of having guys in Istanbul and running the cheese, you know, run, running mm. Levy, who's cheese, and running all the, you know, the fake contacts yeah. that he's got for Levy, and, and then being plugged into Double Cross. And I think there's a really amazing moment where Clark is basically taken to Bletchley and they go, yes, we've been we've been paying attention to your work. <laughs> they, they, they can see him. They can see what he's doing with Cascade in their signals, you know, yeah. in, the, in the German estimations of British strength. It's amazing. Absolutely but also amazing. he comes but across, the, but, I think the other thing about him is that he's just a very, very attractive character. I mean, oh yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. he's he's clever and he's witty and he's vain and 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 all these yeah. sort of things, which which makes him just the most yeah. bit of a snob, all those sort of things. But 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 impossible to dislike. Um, yeah. In fact, actually, yeah. to really like rather a lot, and you know yeah. that makes him such a great guy. He's such a great British sort of smart, clever, eccentric kind of character. Of which the the stuff of which the you know victory and the war is made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, and also he's sort of he's very he's focused on making it look really easy. And obviously, his, they all say his staff work is impeccable. Absolutely, everything about how he how he gets it done. You know, he's completely thorough. He's working incredibly hard, but he's making it all look terribly effortless. easy. You know, he's yeah. effortless. And I think that that's that's also incredibly attractive. He's he's not yeah. doing this whole. You know, I'm working awfully hard, don't you get it? I mean, I love the sort of side stories that one of his secretaries realises that if they've invented loads of fake units, that means she can throw balls so they can have a... (laughs) They can have a, you know, they can have the made-up battalion ball once a week if they want. And that makes it it look credible. These units are socialising and all that sort of thing. It's really, really funny. It's really cool. Anyway. Yeah, I I, I loved it. I thought it's a terrific book. I I really think it's a terrific book. And I I, I hope it does really well for Rob. He absolutely deserves it. Now, uh, funnily enough, I was talking to a friend yesterday about Greyhound um, and yeah. how much he was in, you know, how much he was looking forward to Masters of the Air and how much he loved Greyhound. So, and then, which coincides with you having sent me this book to read. Well, I just, um, and, yes. Well, I, I was suddenly thinking, I, I was just sort of, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone down a bit of a, a, a non-book rabbit hole um, yep. with looking into tribal class destroyers and this sort of yes. life on the seas. And I, and I was rereading bits of The Good Shepherd, also known as Greyhound, yep. when I was finishing off this, this novel I've been doing. Finished, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, handed no, in, which is exciting. I've done that last week. That led me to think, God, we're living, you know, we don't do enough Navy on this, on this podcast. Just don't, no, don't. don't do enough. I was thinking, well, it would be good to do a really good, good convoy. You know, what, what, which convoy should we do? So I started sort of nosing around, and then I came across Peter Gretton, who who has cropped up so many times, um, but kind of peripherally for me, not least when I was doing Malta all those years ago, because he won a DSO uh, when he was on, he was commander of HMS Wolverine, um, which is a destroyer um, on Operation Pedestal. And so he keeps cropping up, and he ended up staying in the Navy post-war, and he's obviously tough as old boots, and exactly the sort of, you know, I mean... Fifth sea lord. He was the, the kind of character on yeah. which the success of the Royal Navy in the Second World War was founded, yeah. you know, kind of started yeah. the war in his late late 20s, sort of, you know, early 30s yeah. by the end of it, got three DSOs, DSC to his name, all that kind of stuff. You know, he's right up there. Mm. Um, and anyway, he, he wrote this very, very detailed account of one single convoy, which is yeah. absolutely not the most remarkable convoy at all by any stretch of the imagination. Right. It's convoy HX231. So this is sailing from, and this is a fast convoy, in inverted commas, because it's not fast yeah. at all, um, going yeah. from ultimately... Um, um, Halifax and Nova Scotia all the way to Liverpool um, in the end of March, beginning of April 1943. So at an absolute pivotal yeah. moment in the Battle of the Atlantic. He turns up in the world at war, so it, 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 he, he's, he's in right. the Right, of course episode, he does. Yes, I'd forgotten that. Yeah, so forgotten so that. people remember that he's he's you know he's the, he's the the, the vo- one of the navy Royal Navy voices that I mean he's pure Royal Navy you know he's he's Dartmouth he's he's done the, you yeah. know he, he's done the he's as Royal Navy as you possibly. As you possibly could be. Got a DSO 1936 for mounting a landing party in Haifa during one of the kind of Arab flare-ups in Palestine. 
Uh, anyway, he wrote this incredibly yeah. detailed account, and it's utterly compelling because what he does, I think, think better than any other personal account I've got, is he explains everything. So he does it. There's no assumed knowledge whatsoever. He explains absolutely everything, why they're doing it, and what what I think comes across so well in a way that I've you don't even get really in the Good Shepherd stroke Greyhound. All the variables, the constant guesswork between the U-boat commanders and the escort commanders and it and it's con you're constantly having to make calculated risks uh, uh, and decisions based on hunch and likelihood second guessing and it's the whole thing is the most astonishing cat and mouse and hoping that the, the, that you know you see something you hope that everyone else has seen something have they seen it what was it you see you hear a light you see a thing you don't hear a bang so you don't think it's a you know and so on and so, so. i mean what's really i mean he's he, the way he sets out his stall is really interesting i also chose convoy hx231 selfishly because i was the escort commander and because i wanted to find out what really happened now amazing which, which isn't makes it me now, now that is amazing because Ridley Scott, of course, about his Napoleon film said, what do you historians know? You weren't there. You don't know what happened. Here is a man who commanded a convoy, who's the escort commander, who's saying, I wanted to find out what happened. I was there and I don't know what happened. So yeah. the, 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 the direct thing is, I've been careful to write the narrative impersonally and I trust objectively and have been as ready to attribute blame as praise to my performance. That yeah. thing's absolutely fascinating and he's trying he says i want to introduce the reader to the human problems of life in a convoy escort escort and the merchant ships under its protection it's 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 which he does with bells on oh it's incredible i mean it's incredible he, i mean there's really a simple does detail come across the human problems and and, and, and yeah. what you also get is is and uh, the thing that's most striking for me and we should maybe talk about this when we get to the end of this i think this will be two podcasts on yeah. this yeah. um it, it is actually the importance of experience and a, yeah. a naval skill and nous compared to yeah. inexperience and and you're yeah. seeing on this convoy you're seeing both examples and and, yeah. and 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 what is absolutely clear to me is that for all the skill of the escorts the b7 escort group that that is beetling around and the air power and all the rest of it that comes yeah. into play and the support group that comes into play etc cetera, etc cetera. What is absolutely patently clear is had this been 1941 and Kretschmer and Preen and uh, <laughs> Shep yeah, they're, um, they're, going, they're all going to the bottom, yeah. The, the, I mean, we'll, you know, the U-boat we'll situa involved simply don't have enough skill to be able to do what they need yeah. to do yeah. by this stage yeah. of the war. Well, we'll, well, we'll get to the yeah, we'll get to the stage of the war in a moment. But just just a couple of tiny insights that he put, that 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 here's the thing about how the a lot of the men are sleeping. A, uh, on deck above deck i know isn't that amazing d d amazing that, 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 i found that i found that absolutely extraordinary um there were particularly from the in the corvettes in the particular corvettes yeah, yeah it's just, because, because uh, so, no one so, wants to be torpedoed there were, were indeed men who unable to stand the thought of being trapped below when off duty were trying to get some rest in corners of the wet cold upper decks and this fear was one of the worst problems facing a captain. Of those men who refused to sleep below, many carried out their jobs efficiently, but others undoubtedly allowed their fears to affect their conduct, the conduct of their duty. The captain would ask himself, should A, B or C be put ashore as unsuitable? To be reliable, the answer needed the qualities of a psychologist as well as the professional judgment of a seaman. I, I just think I, it, it had never occurred to me that, that people would do that. And now, and Yeah, now and it's happening a lot out, in the merchant ships as well, isn't it, in freighters? Yeah. And of course you of course you do that. I mean, you know. Because the last thing you want to be is below the waterline when the torpedo hits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You exactly. might get cold. Anyway. You might get wet. You might get a flu, but you, you you'll still be yeah. alive. That's the principle. March nineteen forty three. Um, in nineteen forty two has been has been so. There's been a happy time in in uh, nineteen forty. And then yes, yeah, so and then midsummer to autumn. Yeah, yeah, and then happy but, time for the U boat then, cruise. Not, I should add. For you, yes, for the U-boat U boat cruise. So, I mean, in 1942, it's 7,790,000 tonnes of shipping sunk. Yes, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a huge amount, I isn't it? I don't, know, I don't know how you get your head around that, that amount, yep. actually. And this yep. is at the same time as torches in the planning, or torches having to happen, and, 
you know, the, 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 I mean, the, the, we've talked about this before. How, how on earth have Americans turned their economy around to the point where they can, you know, within basically within a year and a bit of the war starting, they're they're invading North Africa. It's sort of but bananas, really, isn't it? But they but they do it, and yep. with those shipping losses as well. Yes. Yeah, so the, by the, the end of by, of by the time of the Casablanca Conference in January 1943, there is a there is a shipping crisis, and the shipping crisis is yeah. is caused by a number of different things. The first one is 7.79 million tonnes of shipping sunk in 1942. The second one is because of the the, the vast and ever-increasing global demand, you know, Soviet Union, nationalists in China, accelerating Pacific War. Um, but, but, but one of the immediate short terms is, is the fact that the Tunisian campaign has gone on much longer than everyone thinks. So it's still having to be surprised. And it's just upset all shipping plans and because between april and, and 1942 and may 1943 the priority for u.s shipyards is building assault craft which they don't have enough of rather than freighters so all all of which adds up to a perfect storm of kind of not enough shipping which means that that one of the reasons why at casablanca there's such a um a, 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 a an urgency to win the Battle of the Atlantic is to try and right this situation, <laughs> you know, to well, help the situation. I mean, because obviously, if you know how much shipping is going to come across the Atlantic, then that makes future planning a hell of a lot easier. I mean, Churchill basically, I mean, sums it up pithily, doesn't he? So the, the de- defeat of the U-boat is the prelude to all effective aggressive operations, because you yeah, know, and he and he's, and he's absolutely bang on. You've just illustrated because Tunisia's gone on too long. You've got a shipping. You've got a pinch on shipping, and because there's a pinch on shipping, Tunisia is going on too long. I mean, these things, these things are Mobius strips, aren't they? They come back, they come back on themselves. If you if you can't if you can't supply, you can't win, and if you can't win, it affects supply. You know, pfft, r- r- round the thing goes on itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is which is you know we we we've said it many times on this podcast that the the the, the Atlantic War, as Mark Milner calls it, and I think quite rightly, is uh, as opposed to the Battle of the Atlantic, is um. It is the, the the most strategically important campaign of the entire Second World War because everything flows through it. Um, and without it working properly, the Allies can't hope to kind of succeed in the way that they want to succeed. So so it, it is absolutely vital. And, 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 you know, the sort of revisionist views on, on, on the kind of importance of the Battle of the Atlantic and, or, or otherwise and on the amount of shipping lost. I mean, overall, if you take take the number of ships lost compared to the number of sailings, it's only one point four percent in the battle in the in the in the, uh, in the Atlantic, um, and it's certainly true that eighty five percent of convoys get through unscathed. But that again is over the entire war. But a quarter of all ger- of a quarter of all British British merchant vessels are are, are sunk. Well, t- so yes, it is. So tell, that to the men, you know, tell that to the men sleeping on deck because they don't want to be. You know, correct and we, exactly we, and, and, we come and, ba- and we come back around to that thing of of and we've talked about it we talked about it when we were talking about a bomber crews about you know the eighth air force when they first first start flying missions how do you get people to do this how how on earth do you persuade people to, to do this on, on what uh, you know full stop and you do it by in, by improving your training and tr- improving your kit uh, gaining experience and improving having, the number having, of escorts yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But I yeah, mean, it isn't—it isn't, it course, isn't yeah. so very, you know, being a merchant crewman, for example, it's not so very dissimilar from being on a on a you know flying fortress crew, because obviously you you know the chances of of you being sunk on an individual convoy are pretty small, you know, if you're one of sixty or one of forty. Um, on the other hand, accumulatively, you know, your luck is you you you. you those odds are are decreasing every time you go, and, and everyone knows that. And, and and I think one of the things that that must have been so debilitating for all the crews, whether they be on the escorts or whether they be particularly on the merchant vessels in the in the convoy, is the debilitating tension there must be. You know, there's U boats around, but you know, and it's absolutely clear when U boats are kind of hovering around you, like you know, swarming around you like sharks, and you can't see them, and you don't know when it's going to be you, and you're just going to be on edge the whole time. I mean, it must have been absolutely horrendous. After Casablanca, they then have a they then have a, an Atlantic convoy conference in Washington on the first twelve days of March, nineteen forty three, presided over by the legendary Admiral Ernest King, who, as we all know, is a um, is very much a Pacific 
first kind of guy. But 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 um, various things agreed. You know, which is a uh, there's going to be an, um, a, a Northwest Atlantic Command, um, which will be under the commander of a of a Canadian, uh, and and they will the rapidly growing and and um, increasingly impressive. Royal Canadian Navy will will take the kind of lead on that. Also, plan to keep escort groups together far more possible, uh, uh, much more than had been the case. So, what would tend to happen is you'd form an escort group, and you know you might have um the the, the makeup of that escort group might change quite a lot over the course of six months. You know, come and go, ships refitted, and no one comes in, no one goes out, and they, they, from now on they decide they're going to really try and keep that group as a group, so that you have the benefits of unit cohesion and and mutual trust and and all that kind of stuff all of which which makes makes perfect sense better training of course so you put in charge you know the escort group commander is someone like peter gretton who has been there done it you know been at narvik been at mediterranean been on transatlantic convoys already you know there's not much you can sort of teach him and then obviously the other big thing the big changes is the the increase in numbers of of very long range aircraft and vlrs are very long range and then they're primarily b24 liberators that can fly for up to 16 hours at one time um, and they're operating out of out of newfoundland um out of iceland um out of um northern ireland as well quite often taking six hours to get to the convoy and and it should also be said that the <laughs> u-boats have moved away from the east coast of north america of of, of the american yeah. coast by this point the caribbean and north america and have moved back to the the, the mid the mid-atlantic the mid-ocean um where there is still well, so the, the air gap the air gap exactly but the air gap is closing that's the point um yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um but but of course the allies even at this point just don't have enough vlrs to do what what they want to do in the same way well and and there's resistance within within the british establishment about vlrs isn't there the, the, harris isn't harris isn't going to um give up planes if he can possibly help it there's a tiny bit of sort of inter-service digging from gretton um about you know about Harris's attitude to to aircraft. If you can see that bomber war is obviously relying on materials from the, the war in the Atlantic, then the which one comes first? I mean, it's not it's not even a chicken and an egg, is it? It's um if you want to win yeah. the bomber war, you're going to have to win the war in the Atlantic first. And, and it goes back to your point that you 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 always make very well is 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 that you're always operating six months ahead of where you want to be, and and you know the the just aren't enough of these VLRs and, and the VLR, you know, Harris thinks they could be better used. So, I mean, what does he say? In the present case, it is inevitable that at no distant date, the Admiralty will recognise that U-boats can effectively be dealt with only by attacking the sources of their manufacture. Well, you know, he's 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 completely wrong about that. Yeah, he's completely wrong. You know, that is not the only way that you can effectively deal with, with, with no. U-boats. And in fact, fact no. that isn't the way they deal with The best way to deal with U-boats no. is to sink them out in the middle of the Atlantic, which is which is what they do. And actually, it's interesting. It kill I mean, kill you know, their crews. Because... So you... So you got you got the the Kriegsmarine's um, right. experience base. You know, he's as well. just completely wrong about that. It, it's interesting seeing him. It's interesting. Gretton obviously feels the need to get that off his chest when he's talking when he's talking about this because he because and and you're right. He's he's absolutely he's absolutely right because again, if it comes down to the, the moral component, there's no better way than there's no better way than um, undermining the U-boat service than sinking lots of U-boats and making the crews think it's. Um, horrible and pointless. That has to, that has to be a factor too. In March, there were, in March, Bletchley Bletchley can't read um, uh, Enigma at this point, can it? Um, uh, and yeah, which is which I think is which is which is interesting. I mean, th- whereas I had think a, I the mean, Kriegsmarine, the B Dienst has, has cracked quite a lot of the uh, of the oh, Allied yeah, codes. No, British a long codes. time ago, they're, they're, they've been nosing around in the British British cipher since Norway. So um, they've done they've done ve- they've done very very well against. Okay, you know, they're, they're, you know, if if this is another battle, they're they're currently in the they're currently winning. Um, uh, which I think you know that there is there is no sort of there is no smooth graph of British code code breaking. It's it's it, as you said about the. The destroyer war it's cat and mouse and there's been there's been cat and mouse the germans the germans don't know that they've been broken up broken into up to this point but they have been but at this point they they have that they have that um advantage don't they I mean, it's simple as that yeah uh, and there is there is but but there is also absolutely no question the u-boats are really hurting allied shipping in the first couple of months of of first three months of of 1943 so so in first 10 days of march for 41 ships are sunk 
I mean, that, that, that's four a day going down. Between the 11th to the 20th of March, 44 more. So, so by the 20th of March, half a million tonnes has been sunk already. I mean, that's insane numbers, isn't it? Uh, and then you've got Professor Lindemann, our old friend, uh, Lord Charwell, um, who's, who's Churchill's um, chief scientific advisor. And so, so saying, you, you know, in March 1943, he's going, we're consuming three quarters of a million tonnes more than we're importing. In two months, we could not meet our requirements if this has continued. I, I've started to think of him as kind of like um, Churchill's Dominic Cummings. Um, if yeah, he's a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got, you know, he's an expert. A big on round head he, and these sort of, yeah, sort of little, can, sort of ante- can, little, those little sort of antenna coming up. Sort of, and a sort of myth busty attitude to everything. If only you did it differently, it would all be fine. It, look, read my blog, Lindemann's blog. Him and Solly Zuckerman. Anyway, the, um, yes, but I mean, so he's, that's the situation. He, it's critical. Yeah, yeah he's right. So it is, it is, it is, well, I know, because I think, I think I've been guilty a little bit in the past of sort of blithely sort of saying, ah, no, it was all in the bag, you know, there's no, I mean, there is no question that the, the U-boats couldn't win in in the Atlantic, I think, from, from May 1941. But could they seriously hamper the Allied war effort? Absolutely. And, and there is no question that, that, that in March and April 1943, as we build up to that crucial month of may 1943 when suddenly all the kind of, sort of long uh um changes and developments in the atlantic war sort of come to fruition on the part of the allies and and start to go pear shape for for, for for the germans up until that moment it is it's super tense super critical and and the amounts of shipping getting lost are just of a horrific nature and and it's still winter and this is the point because because the most effective time for the U-boats is winter where it's dark um, and the days are short and the weather is worse because the worse the weather is, the harder it is to read radar, re- pick up on um, radar, harder it is to pick up on ASDIT, which is, you know, what we know is now know as sonar because you've got waves and you've got other disturbances to the water which can kind of cause different um, uh, signals um, you've got, you know, it's harder to spot conning towers in a, in a, in a, you know, when you've got shadows of waves and all sorts of stuff. For all sorts of reasons, in the high summer, it's kind of, it's easier for the Allies. And in, in, in the winter and the spring, it's much, and, and the autumn, it's much, it's much tougher and much better for the U-boats. Yes, anyway. Which I think is, which, well, but I think that's a really interesting point because you'd assume bad weather's bad weather's bad weather. And that makes, if you're operating at sea, it just makes it more difficult full stop, whoever you are. But because the, because the U-boats, are relying on you know c- concealment so being concealed being harder to see is a is a win operationally you're you're automatically if the weather's bad that's good for you even though even though being able to attack is more difficult if you're a u-boat in bad weather you're you're, well, certainly, you're also on, uh, safe. certainly on on high certainly on the surface yeah on the surface but, but you're safer and yeah uh, and that in the that in the end is the the the, the what you're after, isn't it? If you're a U-boat captain, is is being able to remain concealed for the for the critical moments where you need to be. Because after all, there's this, this thing that they go at walking pace underwater, 16 knots on the surface if they can. It's the business of charging the batteries, making sure there's fresh air and all that sort of stuff for the crew. That you you yep. that you really actually that I mean they're not they're submersibles <laughs> rather than or they 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 can submerge right. but not. They're not true Ocean going submarine. underwater vettels. You'd think that bad weather would create a level playing field of things being difficult for everybody, but actually it doesn't. It makes it no. harder for the escorts. Yeah, substantially. Substantially. Yeah. Yeah, and again, this is why sort of Gretton's so good on all this stuff, because he, he, he yeah. explains why so 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 clearly. Um mm. maybe we should take a break and then we should um and then should we get on to Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, the formation of convoys. Let's do that. Uh, we'll be we'll be taking a brief break to form a convoy ourselves, and we will return in formation <laughs> in a second. This podcast is brought to you by AT and T Fiber with Allfy. Something tells me that the guy watching sports for thirteen hours straight on Sunday, who then stays up watching the recaps of those thirteen hours, then calls his friends to talk about it, is definitely going to notice that half a second delay. Get AT&T Fiber with All Fight and watch sports any time of day from anywhere in your house. Live like a gagillionaire. Limited availability in select areas. Go to att.com slash hypergig to check eligibility. Coverage may require extenders at additional charge. Well, 
Welcome back to We Have Ways of Make You Talk. Um, James and I have just set up a signal flare um, and we're forming around the... <laughs> star uh, shell. Star shell and we're forming around the um, uh, bearing that I've sent him. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and illuminating the, the constra- uh, how, how, how a convoy works. Well, I mean... Brightness. Of all, I mean, it's a it's a tricky thing, isn't it? Because let, let's let's just if you you pick a convoy out of a hat. None of the vessels are the same, or some of the vessels are the same. Maybe half a dozen of them are, are Liberty ships or whatever. How how on earth do you you know? You, so you've got to go at the slowest person's pace. So you can you can have you can have a destroyer that can do it. I oh know. W- w- was it the tribals that can do thirty six knots? We were talking about the old twenty six yeah. knots mm. that can really yeah, that can 36. really cut about thirty six knots. So can really cut about. Really, get, really go some whatever because the thing full of grain, you know, or full of zinc or whatever that's at the back of the back of the convoy can only do six knots or four knots or you know, yeah, three or whatever. Oh, so obviously the destroyer speed is all about being a being able to um, a, a encounter and engage uh, U boats anyway, or c- catch up with the convoy once it's done the encountering, engaging. You know, so it's not not yep. off on its own and all that sort of thing. You, you've you've merchant vessels. You've merchant vessels of Norwegian merchant vessels. You've Dutch ones, probably American ones. Yep, Swedish, from American, all over the world, British. Crews from all over the world. Crews with different expectations of uh, the, uh, of all sorts of things, haven't you? So, so right from the start, the simple thing of a convoy, the idea of a convoy. You know, you're herding cats, aren't you? Basically, uh, I mean, just just unbelievably complex thing to do and and yeah yeah i mean i mean the interesting thing is that in the march 1943 is the first time they start putting out 60 ship convoys normally they're 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 40 so 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 convoys are divided into two classes they're either fast or they're slow (laughs) but fast is not fast it's it's an average of nine knots an expectation of nine knots averaged across the atlantic which makes it a very you know that's like a 16 17 day voyage Eastbound convoys HX coded HX from Halifax are um, their HX if they're fast, and their yep. SC Sydney Cape Breton in Canada if they're slow. So that's how you know just by the code name whether it's a fast convoy or a slow convoy. If yep. it's westbound, it's ON if it's fast, and it's ONS if it's slow. And by the end of March 1943, fast convoys are sailing every six days. And slow ones every eight days. I mean that that is just in, an incredible amount, isn't it? Well, I'm just thinking about the. I mean, before before they even put to sea, the the the, the pressure on on the docks and the stevedores yeah. and how you yeah, yeah, how yeah, you yeah, organise yeah, yeah. that loading, and then you've got the yeah. next convoy queuing or in a stacking pattern or whatever, or Does anchored it? off and needing to be protected. I mean, the sheer scale of it, because obviously modern absolutely shipping... absolutely makes your head hurt, doesn't it? Well, because modern sh- trade shipping that we have now, you know, they're, they're, they're not in convoys, so they, they, you know, they come in one by one and, and be dealt, or, or however. It's the fact yeah. that you have a load of ships all turning up at once that need your attention. But just imagine what 60 tra- ships looks like going out to sea yeah. and trying to form up into a, into a, yeah. into a rectangle. And, and the interesting thing about the sea is is that so basically convoys are formed that they're wide rather than deep so they're kind of well they're six miles wide a 60 ship convoy is six miles wide and it's and it's each ship has a number and it might not be one to 60 it might be whatever you know it might be one two one it might be one four three it might be 28 but anyway your number you're given a number and that number is put into a position and there there would be say 14 columns of five or whatever to um in a convoy of 60 something like that between four and five and they would all be two thousand yards the columns would be two thousand yards apart and maybe you know what is it 400 yards in between uh, you know a stern one two three and the uh, five in the line so you might be column 12 ship three that means you're the from, from, from north to south you are the 13th column and you are third in the line from the front so that's how that works and and professor Pratchett blackett great friend of the show who is the head of naval operation research who invents the blackett site and all the rest of it he's the he's the guy who backs uh barnes wallace for the dams rate he's a, when the navy get in early before the RAF do and he makes a point point that actually increasing the the convoys by 20 is actually much more efficient because it doesn't massively increase the perimeter size of the... It doesn't need to nasa, massively increase the perimeter size. doesn't make it that much harder for an, for an escort. 
of of eight vessels to to look after them um, for sixty, whether it's whether it's sixty or forty. And there's lots of sort of harumphing from the from the Admiralty, but actually they then agree. Uh, and of course, that you know that that just does make a big difference because you've got the, the more of you there are, the more are going to get through. Yeah, you know, it's as simple yeah. as that. Well, and the more, and, but also, and also, the more pairs of eyes there are, and the more the the, the oh, all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And even merchant ships have have some protection. I mean, they have sort of you know Erlikons on them and all the rest of it, and flares and you know, and so on and so forth. So, so you know, it's it's yeah, you know, it's 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 it does mean a greater pressure on Liverpool and Greenock and Gurukh and all these kind of places and and Nova Scotia and and Halifax, Nova Scotia. But 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 it does make the chances of getting through greater. There's no question about it. Uh, which is interesting. So, the Uber, so that's how convoy is set up. Well, you, but you, you know, you, it, 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 that in a way kind of also feels kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because it feels like a bigger, juicier target for for wolf packs, doesn't it? That that, that you're serving up more ships for the for the Germans to attack. You can see why. If you know the the, the, the counterintuition is that surely. Ships on their own, going as fast as they possibly can, are better off. It's, which is where the thinking starts, isn't it? Convoys are seen as a kind of last resort, aren't they? C- going into convoy is seen as a is seen as a oh, we're going to have to do that again. And then perfecting it is seen as a you know, like you say, the people are dragging their heels about about how best to do it because 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 I think you end up going at three knots all the way across the Atlantic, and that feels like and with sixty ships, that feels like a great big fat juicy target, doesn't it? it feels that, that must feel very on, on one level very vulnerable. Uh, 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 well, uh, slow, well, slow, slow convoys are going. At, um, they're they're no more than forty um, in in size, rather than sixty. It's only the fast one, the fast ones in inverted commas are, 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 are sixty ship yeah. convoys where they are going. You know, they're going aiming to go at least nine. Um, and obviously, the, the the average speed of the uh, of the convoy depends on the makeup of the convoy. As you say, you've always, you've always got to go at the pace of the slowest. Yeah, you know, if you're if you're a wolf pack and, and so, so I mean, we're going to get to the U-boat situation in a second. If you're a wolf pack, sure, surely what you do is pick off the destroyers, Jim, <laughs> and then you can and then you can sink the convoy at, at your leisure. But the, the, however, that is that is, however, yes, go on. Well, that's not their mindset, which I, which I, you know, I find which I find absolutely extraordinary. They just don't spend enough time focusing on the escorts. So you default the first thing you should it's do incredible. is destroy the escorts, and, and they just yeah. don't. They never do. It's never yeah. their tactics. Yeah. You know, escorts then, are much, much harder to hit, of course, because they're not going yes, straight and steady in a single line. You know, they're moving around all over the place. But even so, it, clearly it makes much more sense to get rid of the escorts. Then you can do what you like, as you say. It's remarkable, isn't it? Um, the tactical uh, so genius of the you, Germans in the Second World War. Well, <laughs> so the, the, the Germans have 116 U-boats. Operating um, in the Atlantic at this point, they've, they've got about three hundred by this this stage. They've got about three hundred by this stage, and you know you're, you're 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 based on the third, so a third going to and forth, a third kind of training and re-equipping and all the rest of it and yep. building up, and a third actually on, on in in combat. On that that's 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 the the kind of rule of thumb, and and it's not far off it. But but of course by this stage you know they, they've got they've got these because the U boat arm was only three thousand men strong in 1939. It's very difficult to massively expand when you're also at the same time taking really critical losses. And and you know one of the reasons why the spring of 1941 is so crucial in the in the Atlantic War is because so many of the aces the U boat aces get get lost. And by I mentioned at the beginning kind of sort of you know. Kretschmer, Shepka and um, and Preen, all three go in, two of them are killed, one of them taken prisoner between March and May 1941. And, and you, you know, this experience, these are guys who've been in, in submarines since, you know, the 1930s. They're absolutely, you know, totally what they're about. They're incredibly skilled, highly trained, highly competent, bit older, got all that kind of sort of gravitas and, and, and authority and, and all the rest of it. And they're just gone. And by 1943, there is literally no one of any significant repute still operating in the U-boat arm by this stage because even those that have survived, like Eric Top, Teddy Seuron, these kind of types, they're now very sensibly on training rather than risking their lives out in the Atlantic. What that means is you've got way, way, way more U-boats than you had in 1940 and 1941, but you haven't got that depth of experience. And that's the problem about having the U-boat are being so small in 1939 is that when you do need to suddenly expand, you haven't got that weight of, of, of manpower to be able to spread through and, and take on the, um, you know, and, and, and 
and lead with the the next generation as it's rapidly expanding. So they're having to kind of sort of work on this sort of on the hoof with insufficient training, insufficient experience, and it, and and crucially, U boats are being U boat com- captains are being pr- promoted as Oberleutnant, you know, first lieutenant, yeah, yeah. way before they should be because pressure of numbers and all the rest of it and yeah yeah yeah, yeah. they're out of people it, and so, it, so it's the, ever decreasing I mean, circles that's, that's a point i'm trying to make really. yeah i mean what's their what's their sort of culture from the first world war because after all you know the the, the u-boat campaign in the first world war was again <laughs> very effective and, and all, all this sort of stuff i mean are they, is it obviously it's it works and it's 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 actually the it's the it's sort of the one thing you've got that could you know that could on a tactical level to deliver a strategic result so it seems straight, and they and they know this. They must know this. So it's strange, yeah. really, that, that that they haven't invested so heavily in it that they ought to have done. I mean, it, it is it is peculiar, isn't it? That that and I've got, again, what this will, will come round to is this. This is the problem: is you've got Hitler, whose mentality is he needs big, showy battleships to show the public that rearmament's happening, and to do things exactly in the sort of P, he's got to do things in this the. This is PR a Z plan sphere. of. of- yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That 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 so much the rearmament is is about PR and is about p- presenting a thing to people. And submarines submarines don't offer you that. Also, if you build well, a you load of submarines, that, I mean, I, I reckon I reckon I reckon fifty U boats all lined up in harbour would look pretty pretty powwow. Particularly when everyone knows how successful the U boats were in the last war. Yes, but but then as a result, and then the, I mean, but of course you, you're then signalling your intentions to your potential enemies. And if you're building lots of U boats, you obviously you obviously want to fight the British, don't you? Because because they're the world's preeminent maritime power. So you rather get you build you build a load of U boats. You rather give the game away that you're considering fighting the British Empire. Don't you, 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 okay. you know I mean? Well, yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And, and signalling your intentions to the other side. And, and Hitler's intention isn't to fight necessarily the British. It's to it's to well, not in the nineteen thirties, it isn't no. Not in the nineteen thirties, it isn't anyway. Exactly, which is when which is when these things are getting laid down. Whereas the the British, for all their sort of all their sort of pussyfooting about it, they they know perfectly well they're going to end up fighting the Germans next. If they're going to fight anybody, so in a peculiar way, there's a, there's so they're a, also destroyers. Confu- exactly. So there's a you know a, end up with a cavity magnetron and all that sort of thing. So so for all the all the British. I'm humming and ahhing about fighting the Germans. The, it's the Germans who's in decision, in the in the nine, lack of intent. I mean, here's this is this a this is a direct flip of the appeasement story, isn't it? So Germans can't yeah, make yeah. their mind up about who they're going to fight, and that's what they're re- that's the thing they're reaping right at this moment. Whereas the British, who've always thought in the end we're going to have to fight. A, a maritime war because we're a maritime power. Yeah, yeah, you know, that absolutely, inter- absolutely. Is that as interesting? It's a funny we've ended up with. We go. That's a, another, a, another. No, a little rabbit hole. We done. Yeah, we flipped that fried egg over. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, anyway, but, so, so, so what, that's the situation. What, beginning in 1940, yeah. um, so, 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 so beginning in 1943. There's lots of U-boats, but they're not very skilled. It's basically the long and short. And of it. how do they but, operate? Because because this is the thing that that, that um, Gretton's book I was really struck by, and and that the, the method that the destroyers have is they figure out that what that the wolf pack they have to ask permission to engage the the U-boats, so they they essentially report back to their to their um to the lead boat. Control. I've ich habe dieses destroyed. It's not even lead boats. It's controlled back at back at sort of you know it's, northern fact, France. Yes, the, the, yes northern France, Lorient or whatever. Which is extraordinary, because that doesn't sound much like alpha tactic to me. If what you're having to do, no, or, and, and, and that's also a reflection of of the collapse in less, experience and um, confidence. Uh, yeah, yeah. But 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 really, it's about it. it it's it's not so much that. It's more about coordinating a wolf pack. So what Dennis is doing by by the spring of 1943 is he you know wolf packs used to be kind of sort of half a dozen by by now they're kind of formed into groups of twenty twenty is considered the kind of op- it's considered pretty much the optimum because after that it gets it gets sort of too unwieldy and too complicated but what that means is you've got to sort of you've got to actually be quite careful about how you do this so what would what would generally happen is the Germans get wind of a convoy sailing so they know it's coming. They know kind of roughly what the route is. So what you would do is you would then you you would you would get, then get your U boats into a kind of massive line, say your twenty each sort you know where the total line is about two hundred and eighty miles something like that or three hundred miles or two hundred fifty miles, but but a big old stretch and you would advance towards where you think the convoy is likely to be and then the moment one of them 
sees it, spots the convoy, they are then the contact keeper and all the other U-boats then home towards it. It's like, right, I've got it. It's a, it seems to be a period, you know, it seems to be moving on a, on, you know, on a, on a bearing of 045 degrees. You know, I've got it in my sights. And the idea is to try and let the, the convoy come onto you so you can attack it from the front so that you, you, you get into the right position using your surface speed, but then you attack it from under the surface as it's coming towards you. That's basically the idea. But what that means is you, 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 the, the person who makes a contact has to signal that contact and signals back to control, BDU, the, the, um, um, you know, the, the headquarters of the, of the U-boat arm, and says, you know, well, I've got this, I, I found the, car, the, the, the convoy, this is where it is. And then it is control that is feeding the signals back to the other U-boats and saying, right, this is where the convoy is, you know, head on this bearing X and, and off you go. But 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 the contact keeper is not, as you as you rightly point out, is not allowed to make any contact, it is not allowed to attack until given permission to do so. And that's because they don't want to kind of to, to, to attack prematurely and make the convoy scatter or change just before all the 20 have homed in on it that's that that's the I mean, main what, reason what's very interesting is in the in the um the the official the authorized gchq history uh, john ferris talks about how that it's really really interesting he says that the german sigint at this point is so good locating convoys and and dis- discovering allied intentions that actually what it does is it it makes them make terrible operational decisions he says he says because 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 the, the you know german intelligence intelligence success lured germans into operational failures so he says because they because they're able to do what we're just talking about because they can because they can figure this out figure out how to engage convoys they they actually send themselves into engaging convoys and then the allies overpower them he he says um the germans the germans in in the in the atlantic are relying purely on their intelligence to conduct the campaign Whereas the British are relying on their operational, mili- you know, uh, industrial, technological, and intelligence capability to fight the campaign. Germans only bring one thing to the party; they will be overwhelmed and destroyed. And then he talks about, you know, but but by the end of it, you know, the the, the British are deliberately sailing convoys onto the U-boats to draw them into battle to destroy them. Because once they've got the once they've got the thing figured out, they tell the Bedienst where they are. And, you, and and they're they're reading the Bedienst as well. You know they're reading they're reading what the Germans think is happening. But no, but obviously March forty three. They're blind at this point. But but by the time it flips, the, you know the, the the German operational German, German uh, uh, superiority with with intelligence leads them into operational disaster, which I think is an, an amazing way of looking at it. Um, yeah, uh, isn't the, it the, the, fascinating? Yeah, absolutely I've never really fascinating. About it like that. Well, yeah. so from the British point of view, there's there's basically sort of three electronic w- means of detection. There's 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 yep. obviously there's radar on board radar, um, yep. which most it's of them have off. by this stage. Uh, there's huff yep. duff high frequency direction finding, which is sort of you know getting picking up radio signals, and then of course there's yep. ASDEC, which we we now know as sonar. So so yep. huff duff is really interesting. M- most of the um, the escorts are normally equipped with 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 huff duff, not always, but 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 most of them yep. are. Um, and that enables them to pick up these sort of ra- any radio signals that the, the U boats uh, and from where it is you can you can pick it up and the, and the kind of that enables them to to pinpoint pretty much where the U boat is that has sent that signal yeah. um, and and the Amity also ha- and get a bearing from it and and the Amity also has a series of shore based huff duff stations high frequency direction finding stations yeah and, and these are scattered through kind of Iceland Northern Ireland Scotland the Azores and uh, and so on and, and and a massive information is coming in and and this is analysed. Um, um, <clears throat> and the Admiralty tracking room in London, and this is it's it's also you know other intelligence is coming in as well. So so anecdotal from agents from from Bletchley Park, all the rest of it, and it's, and it's a bit like the kind of filter room at, at um or or the control control room at kind of um Bentley Priory for Fighter Command. You know all this material is coming in, and it, and it has to be analysed and then sort of regurgitated. And by this point, point also most, in fact, all ocean-going escorts, even the kind of corvettes and frigates, which are the kind of smaller escorts, have the new centrime- centimetric radars, which I think is a Type Two Four Seven, um, which means that they can detect U boats out further than before on a calm sea, about four miles, something like that. You know, which and, doesn't need that much says, time, but but but. Well, he says the Asdic's two thousand meters, isn't it? Basically, if again the, on on good weather, on good weather, and 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 again we come back. 
we come back to that. There's a level playing field if the weather's all right, but if it isn't, it, it, it it's very advantageous to the U-boats. So the, peri- so, the perimeter well, of, think- of a 60-ship of a convoy is 60 miles. I mean, it's a hell of a distance. And, yeah. you know, really eight escort ships. I mean, you can do it with six, but eight escort ships is the kind of sort of minimum you want. The problem is, is, is because of the shipping shortage by, by March 1943, there aren't enough fast destroyers to do what you want yeah. to do. You know, there's, there's been losses. They're still making more and the rest of it. But what they're really trying to do is, is build bulk and build numbers yeah. to, so that you've got enough escorts for these, you know, convoys every six days and every eight days. Um, yeah. You know, so what that actually means is is that every eight days you've got two transatlantic convoys going across, which is a hell of a lot, all of which need escorting. So the way around this is to build smaller boats because they're cheaper and easier and quicker to build than destroyers. And destroyers, if you think a destroyer is sort of, you know, 90 to 120 metres in length, that kind of scale, you know, a, a, a corvette is like 60, 65. Yeah. So it's a similar sort yeah. of length to a, to a landing ship tank, the LCT, outside the yeah. museum in Portsmouth, for example. Uh, um, yeah. Frigates are a bit bigger. Um, they're more like kind of 80. But, but, but they're pretty small. An HX-231 has only got six, of which yeah. one is a destroyer, one is a frigate, four a corvette. You'd have, you'd have one, one ship at the front, in the bow, you know, out, out front. Then you'd have two on the kind of, sort of port and starboard side. Then on the two on the beam. And then you'd have one at the back. And your fastest ship would always be the one at the back because that's the one in, you need to go off and do sweeps if they, something's gone missing or, you know, ship's dropped out or, you know, that you said your fastest one because it's it's the ablest to, to, to get back to the rest of the convoy quickest. We should pause here for our, until our next episode. It's going to be three, will, isn't it? It's going to be three. When we will, we will look at the convoy HX231 and what happens um, in late March... Into April 1943. I don't want to. Give, I don't want to give anything away. I don't want to give anything away. But but it's an amazing story. And and, and it is an extraordinary. I story. really think it's worth doing this in some detail because it is so interesting how these things work. There's so many aspects about these convoys and about the escorts and about the U boats and about how they operated that one simply just doesn't know. And and so to have this kind of spelt out, I think, is, is with one example, um, I think is a really, really useful exercise. Leave New York at 0850 hours yep. on the 25th of March. What happens next? We'll see you next week. Uh, we hope you're on the edge of your seats the way we are um, uh, about, about HX231 um, and what's to come. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Cheerio.